Good morning and a very warm welcome to our event today on the future of European industry or towards a European industrial rena re renaissance. It's my great pleasure to welcome you today to this event. My name is Gunther Wolf and I'm the director of Brügel and it's an honor to host today a group of industry leaders from Europe that will share their thinking uh, with us today on what this future of industry could look like, what are the key industrial policy trends, how do we deal with digitalization, how do we deal with climate change, how do we get out of um, this very peculiar pandemic and how will work be organized um, in the future and how should it be organized in the future. Many, many big questions um, that we often tend to discuss with um, policymakers, with academics, um, but less so with um, chief executives from uh, big European uh, companies. And so the idea today really was to, to get the voice and the accent on the industry perspective. And um, of course, um, hear this perspective and then discuss it with you, our audience um, in this event today. You, uh, audience, our audience, you can actually ask us questions by going on the website Slido, sli.do, and typing the code industry. And those questions will then appear on my smartphone so that I can actually uh, see and read them and um, ask them to our panelists. But before we turn to uh, the discussion with the audience, let me very warmly welcome our three panelists today. Vinod Kumar is the Chief Executive of Vodafone Business. Uh, Jean-Marc Olanier is the Chief Executive of Accenture in Europe. And Claire Vesson is the Executive Vice President um, of Engie. And uh, she was up to recently um, actually um, the CEO, um, the co-CEO of, of Engie um, in France. So we have three uh, very important um, businesses that, that are present in Europe, in different countries, in different sectors. And we really want to first hear from um, each of you, um, uh, what, what is your take on European industrial renaissance and then um, uh, engage in a conversation among us um, and of course with the audience. So again, a very warm welcome and thank you for joining us today. And let me first give the floor to you, uh, Vinod, um, so that we, uh, we hear first the perspective from Vodafone. So, okay, I'm just turning my mute off. Firstly, thank you very much and good morning, everyone. And I'd like to thank Briugel for the invitation um, to join this discussion on such an important topic. I would like to say, start, starting off, that it is right to be optimistic about the future of European industry. Personally, I am filled with optimism. And the reason for that is, as a continent, we have true leaders in manufacturing, in automotive, in energy, in finance, agriculture, and many other areas. Also, when you study the ecosystem in Europe, I think we must draw comfort from the fact that it is not particularly skewed by the contribution and impact only by a few large players. And that we actually have a good combination of both specialized, smaller and niche players, as well as large scale players. This definitely makes any system much more dynamic and resilient and always capable of innovation. However, equally it is important that we don't rest on our laurels. I believe that the effective use of technology is vital to make, take these industries to the next level, which we call industry 4.0. This is something that we in Europe must really encourage and support if we are to remain competitive, especially as the global stage widens with more and more players coming into the equation. Today, I'd like to speak to the topics which are a bit closer to my area of expertise, which is communications technology and my area of interest which is the role and importance of small and medium businesses in our economies. <clears throat> First, 5G and the Internet of Things are really at the heart of Industry 4.0. They will deliver massive change and help make what may be science fiction concepts or what have been science fiction concepts uh, till now, such as remote surgery or autonomous driving, a reality. We not only have it in our labs today, we're also working with customers for limited production and in, as proof of concepts in a very live working environment. 
the many changes in 5G and IoT will unlock a huge opportunity for European businesses, both to use to drive productivity and improve efficiency, but also to create new technologies and new business models. And we must not lose this opportunity because there's a game changing inflection point that we are living through as we speak, as we shift from 4G to 5G. Data digitalization and high-speed connectivity will also be big catalysts for <clears throat> the green industrial leadership. Here again, I think there's a big opportunity in, in Europe. We in Vodafone are big believers of digital for green, and we're committed in working with customers to reduce their carbon emissions by nearly 350 million tons by 2030. This is a big goal, but we're fully committed to it. A big part of delivering this effect will be through IoT services. We already have a lot of data that proves that IoT enabled businesses actually have more sustainable operations. Applications such as fleet management, smart metering, digital farming and next generation man manufacturing are all big opportunities for us in Europe. The journey has begun, the ball is rolling. We need to make sure that we keep pressing forward on it. Just to give you a statistic here, <clears throat> we have about 120 million IoT connections that we enable and support worldwide. And we estimate that nearly 30% of these directly enable customers to reduce their carbon emission. But we believe that there is more that can be done with the sensors, the actuators, the technology, and the AI that sits behind it to make an even deeper impact and an even broader impact. If these benefits are really there for the taking, you know, what must in European industry do to catch this digital wave? I'll begin with <clears throat> um, SMEs. Uh, but before that, the most important foundation is that we need to make sure that we move quickly, moving at speed to capitalize on the advantages we have in some of the mobile technologies, the work that we're doing in, in industry 4.0, advanced manufacturing needs to be kept uh, uh, moving forward with policies that enable it. We absolutely cannot afford to fall behind at such a crucial time. And the regulatory environment that supports digitization is something that has to be at the forefront of everybody listening to this call. <clears throat> Secondly, it is vital that the policy decisions that we make reaches everyone. Small and medium enterprises are really the beating heart of Europe. They make a big part of our economies. They contribute nearly 85% of the new jobs in the private sector, and they make societies and countries more vibrant. However, sadly, many of these companies are really struggling as we go through this peculiar situation in the world with COVID-19. The silver lining though, when we look at the customers who are living the pandemic is that those who have adopted digital technologies are using it as a lifeline and in many cases using it as a catalyst to grow and actually even thrive. But there's a dark cloud here to that silver lining and that is the European Commission found that only 17% of SMEs have actually successfully adopted digital technologies. This compares to 54% for larger organizations. Further, when you look at European SMEs, we are behind both our American and Asian counterparts when it comes to leveraging digital business models and digital technologies fully. Therefore, as this new normal we were driven to by COVID-19 becomes the normal that we'll have to live with going forward, large organizations and policymakers, it is absolutely essential that we work with SMEs to help them overcome the challenges that they face, especially when it comes to implementing technology, because that can be a, um, a make or break uh, opportunity for them. This means it's not just about technology that, and just the tools. It's also about how to use the tools. Therefore, the advice that goes with it and also the reskilling and the training that is required to use the tools effectively are an important part of the equation when it comes to digitization of SMEs. The recovery and resilience facility, which is aptly named the next generation EU, gives us a really good starting point to address the challenges with digitization. From our perspective, we see that high speed and reliable connectivity is really the foundation and maybe the starting point for all digitalization. And the pandemic has proven that imagine a world that if we didn't have all the connectivity in these kinds of tools, we wouldn't have been able to keep the economies and keep societies going. To meet the connectivity targets that have been established by the EU in 2025, 
we face an annual investment gap. <clears throat> this gap has now grown to 42 billion. It used to be about 30 billion, and that's an annual investment gap. And this is continuing to grow, and we must do things to move forward and address it. That, that, be, that brings me to my third point, <clears throat> and that is to bridge this kind of gap that is growing, we need to put the EU recovery funds to work and policy reform that need, has to go with it hand in hand, both need attention. It is important that both private and public institutions work together to ensure that the funds are spent where they needed the most. And for instance, in our case, I just mentioned, it is important for us to focus as policymakers and large businesses on SMEs, but also digitizing public services in many areas like health are really where the investment needs to be channeled. And I'm sure the panel will be discussing that more. <clears throat> While looking at the policies, there should be an encouragement of private investment along with public funds. The both need to be viewed together. The funds need to be deployed in a way that complements private investments, but equally it should not distort competitive environments. There is, this is really important that it is done in a fair, transparent way and based on market structures. We believe firmly that there's a prosperous future for a confident Europe that should take its rightful place at the forefront of a global process and global progress. The right industrial policy will be a key enabler that will support both business success in our backyards, but also make our businesses competitive on the global stage. The right industrial policy will enable the rollout of the right technologies, and these right technologies in turn will underpin our success and growth in industry 4.0. To get there, we need to make sure that we have the technology infrastructure as well as the regulatory support to give our businesses a truly winning global platform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vinod. That was very, very clear and um, a big focus on uh, obviously uh, digitalization, technology and connectivity which I'm sure uh, will echo also with what Jean-Marc Olanier will, will, will want to say. Um, and um, afterwards, I guess with, with Claire, we will hear more on climate related issues, but let's see. I mean, um, uh, um, let's see uh, what each of you has to say. And then uh, we want to engage in a conversation on, on the various issues raised. I already took a lot of notes um, to, uh, to come back to, to all of you with questions. Jean-Marc, uh, thank you for joining and please, the floor is yours. Uh, you are muted for the moment. Uh, you have to unmute. Ah, it, okay. no. yeah, it should be it should be fine. Yeah. No, thanks, uh, Guntram. And, uh, you know, uh, thanks for the opportunity also to share a couple of thoughts. I remember one year ago, and you know, sometimes the world moves fast, you know, just one year ago, we were together uh, with a group of experts talking already about industry renaissance with very good ideas. Maybe one thing we forget and we do not very well anticipate it was COVID, you know, which happened, you know, literally at that time, just a year ago. And I think all of us should remind ourselves that uh, since then the world move on, but uh, certainly uh, the first focus for many of us as leaders, you know, in this period has been business continuity, people safety, you know, we have had to deal with a, a crisis, frankly, that uh, none of us uh, was very familiar with, you know, we never learned COVID in any management book or in any good school, so we have been extremely pragmatic as a business leader to deal with something extraordinary which obviously uh, is still not fully solved, as you know, because, you know, the pandemic is still around the corner, as we say. But I will say since a couple of months, the focus for many of us, you know, in our own business has been more around, you know, shaping what we call the new normal. And as we not say, you know, the new normal will become the normality, hopefully. But uh, I will say three things that really uh, struck me in that period. And I think could a bit uh, give you my... Uh, my thinking around uh, where the industry is going right now uh, as we speak. So three things which are really important because many of them have been accelerator of trend and that might be my first remarks is, you know, digital and sustainability has been very much mentioned by many executives as trends that are reshaping uh, many of the industry as we speak. It is clear that on digital, you know, um, some of the comments from Vinod I very much share, you know, we see digital technology very much in the enterprise, you know, because of COVID has been an accelerator, all of this we know. 
I think the consumer and retail online business has been also something important. But I think what is more excited right now on digital for the industry is that the development of 5G, the development of IoT is clearly creating an opportunity for the manufacturing business. We see more and more today project on the industry side regarding digitalizing operation from R&D, engineering and manufacturing. And this is linked to the readiness of new technology. And there is more than an acceleration on this space, on this topic as we speak. So that's really on the acceleration side. I think Europe, has been quoted a bit as behind in many uh, research, including uh, research in Brussels compared to China and US. You know, more investment on technology is probably required in Europe, either to catch up from where, you know, uh, the competition is on small business, as we not say, but also overall, and if we, you know, uh, see an opportunity, certainly an acceleration. On the other trend of sustainability, what is changing the game right now is that you know, sustainability was very much linked to energy transition on, in some industry. I think today sustainability is everywhere. You know, what is really new is that uh, all industry realize that they have a role to play to deal with climate change and to be a responsible business. They have to operate in a more sustainable way, their own operation. And this is now true across all sectors. And I think that's what makes it, uh, you know, really exciting. And here, Europe is more considered as being ahead in terms of awareness, but also in terms of business model. And this is certainly for Europe and for the industries that have a role to play an opportunity. And I think that's certainly a topic where we see acceleration. You know, at uh, Davos last week, uh, or two weeks ago, we announced, you know, uh, that digital and sustainability needs to be on top of every CEO's mind because we, we explain in our survey that if you master digital technology and if you master sustainable services, you have much more opportunity to you know, be successful as a company in this new normal. So that's certainly a topic where we can confirm what has been said. But I think we see more than that. I think the second topic on the second observation, which I think is very interesting because it's also an acceleration of trend in many ways, but it's an acceleration of the transformation of industries. And frankly, sometimes a reinvention of those industries. That's why I like personally the world industry renaissance because it fits well with Europe. And it's a kind of reinvention that we are, that we are seeing. Uh, Davos called it the great reset. I don't know if it's a good word, but you know, certainly there are many words out there that are looking more to transformation of business model, more than an acceleration only of uh, adoption of new technology, of new uh, sustainable services. You know, I will be uh, modest on technology, as Claire will mention it, but what's happened in energy is incredible. You know, look at what's happened with electrification, with uh, decarbonization, with new energy. I think there is a level of innovation that we have not seen in many ways, and that will lead to business transformation and reinvention of business model. But it's true also in the mobility sector, with electrification uh, of the mobility scale, uh, you know, for cars, and you know, uh, the way you're going to buy mobility services in the future versus buying car. This is a reinvention that is an historical one. But you can see also consumer goods, food business, retail, between sustainability products, uh, new expectation from consumer, plus online, you are reinventing in many ways. The tech sector is changing as well. You know, if you add cloud plus 5G, you have a massive reinvention of the tech sector combined with the need to be more carbon efficient. So it's also another industry that we're, we're gonna see. And I can go on and on, but what is interesting today is even though many executives like us are dealing with short-term pain on short-term issues, there is more and more dialogue around. It looks like we are at the beginning of reinventing the world. And by the way, we probably need it if we want to meet some of the climate change targets that we're gonna talk about probably. So that's the second observation, which, uh, probably is a, a bit of optimism on my side that there is interesting prospect out there in terms of reinvention of the industry. The third topic, which may be, by the way, the most important on that, I'm sure we're going to get questions on it, is talent. What does it mean for, you know, our citizen employees that are out there? Because those transformation, which seems to be quite significant at scale and probably at speed, 
will require a significant uh, involvement on reskilling, upskilling, because it's not going to be exactly the same type of work. And I don't want to scare everybody with the robots or whatever that will, uh, it, but the reality is, yes, we're going to have to change the way we operate if we want to have an impact on the industry, on the business, and also on the planet. So that is a topic which is very high today on all of us' mind. Uh, it's very high to deal with our own employees, to be sure we provide them with the right opportunity to learn, but also with, I will call me the vulnerable population, because all of us are extremely sensitive to what's happened around us and what COVID you know, has generated is probably a disproportionate impact on vulnerable population, which will require probably uh, the company to step up, but probably company on government, on other association to step up in order to deal with something that is far from being over, which is how we deal with population that have less education or have been more vulnerable because of the crisis. So those three things are clearly on many of, certainly on my mind as executive, you know, uh, of our own business, but certainly in the conversation I have with many executives. So, you know, clearly all of us will have to step up, you know, and in the dialogue we have with this institution in Europe, as you say, Guntram, there is many things to say. On the positive side, I'm very proud of the recovery fund. You know, I think, you know, the scale of it, the focus, and I would say the alignment level is probably really a good news and it will certainly help us, but there is still much more to do. First of all, we'll have to allocate the fund and be sure that, uh, you know, we see it coming on the, but there is all the discussion, you know, of how we work as an ecosystem, you know, to be sure that the different uh, industries in Europe collaborate uh, to compete, you know, I'm very proud of those initiatives on hydrogen, on batteries. I see also what's happened with GaiaX on tech. There are many industry sectors that are moving with the coordination of Europe, but there's still a lot to do there. And there's still a lot to do, in my view, on talent, where, as I say, as businesses, we need to step up, but we're going to need to have much more support uh, because this is a great opportunity for the next generation, in my view, but we have to ensure that we have the right partnership to develop the talent we need, because the good news, in my view, is we're going to do a lot of talent to deal with that, a lot of good talent of engineers, of people that are willing to reshape those industries, but we're going to have to uh, train, educate, and, uh, and go for it. So much more discussion on this topic, but I was just willing to share those three, well, frankly, those three observations, which are very much uh, giving me optimism around where we are going, even though, you know, day in, day out, we are dealing with, with COVID. Back thank to you. you. Thank you so Thank you so much, Jean-Marc. Um, also very clear and uh, interesting that both of you mentioned um, the recovery fund. And so uh, I'm sure we will have some time discussing, discussing that also. And I think also very interesting um, the, uh, the aspect, you know, um, how we get out of this COVID situation and, um, you know, how much we have been absorbed really um, as executives. And here I include actually myself as an executive of a small company, uh, a small, um, I mean, think tank. But still, I mean, the management of the personnel and the management of, uh, you know, the, the crisis situation and now the rethinking of the future business model and how that, that will adopt uh, and it will evolve, I think is a fascinating aspect um, of um, of how we get out of this um, this situation, but let me uh, give the floor to to Claire uh, Claire uh, from NG to hear. I think what and Jean Marc you mentioned already the fascinating innovation that is happening in the energy space, um, which I think is one of the big the big trends, the green deal. I mean, making sure that um, we transform our industry and move away from carbon uh, carbon based energy, and that's thanks to innovation. And so so let's hear uh, from Claire. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, thank you, Guntram, and uh, very, very happy to be uh, sharing uh, sharing this discussion with you. A lot has been said already, um, and I will not diverge from what has been said, but uh, but indeed add a bit, uh, including focusing uh, more on the energy sector. Um, let me start by one thing, which is COVID, um, a, a common point we 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 share. Uh, COVID is a huge shock to all of us. Uh, I think I, I, I mean it very deeply. Huh? It's, a, it's a big shock for some industries for which it will impose radical changes. For others, less so in the energy sector, there will still be a need for energy, of course. 
uh, but still a very big shock to all people, to all the economies, and a shock that shows how interdependent we are on a global scale. So I will start with this. Uh, it's clearly big shock, showing out our interdependencies, showing that there is a need for collective action. And that's uh, my first optimistic note to, to rejoin my the former speakers. This COVID situation showed that when we act together and each of us as companies, we had responsibilities that we faced. Uh, we, we ensured continuity of our services. We cared for our people. Uh, we ensured our return to balance and growth and the governments as well and Europe. So need for a collective action, that's what was done in this COVID crisis. And this ability to act together will very much be what we need in the next few years, including on a global scale. And, uh, and, and that's especially true when you think about climate change, uh, the need to go towards carbon neutrality, as, uh, as you, you, uh, you stress, Guntram. Uh, this is a shared global responsibility. And there is now, I think, a bit more hope on the global scale. Uh, due, due to uh, due to recent uh, recent elections, so on uh, wh when we think about where the industry is going, I think the first point is really, and that was shared by former speakers, how do we ensure prosperity, growth together with sustainability? And this is especially uh, true for climate change issues. We know that we were on an unsustainable path before the COVID. There was no way we were going to meet uh, our, uh, our, uh, our, our COP, uh, COP targets in terms of uh, rise in temperature. So clearly the path was unsustainable and we have now a chance, and that's to me really what one of the priorities of uh, the industrial renaissance should be about. We have a chance to change the path and to move towards a sustainable path. On, uh, which is consistent with climate change. How do we get there? Uh, well, two ways. First, uh, to, to address the climate change issue, we all need to decrease our consumption of energy. Yeah, that's the first thing. And it may, it may seem strange from an energy producing company, but actually, energy, we are two things. We are producing and we are selling energy and every day more renewable. Currently, renewables are 30% of our production of electricity. We aim to double it uh, by 2030. And, and we have already reduced our carbon uh, footprint of uh, production of electricity uh, by two between 2012 and 2017. And we will do the same until 2030. So first thing we need to green energies, of course. But it's not enough. No? We all know, and all of the studies show that if we want to uh, succeed in climate change fight, we, we also need to reduce consumption uh, roughly by 30, 40%. And that's actually also part of our job. That's what makes us special as an, an energy provider. We are both an energy provider and selling services to businesses, to communities uh, to reduce their energy consumption. Uh, we, we do this with uh, U.S. universities, we do this with uh, French uh, high school, uh, so we, we, we have long-term contracts where we commit to a 30-40% uh, reduction in, in consumption. And I think that's really the two feet we need when we think about energy transition, change our ways of working, producing, consuming to reduce energy consumption and, uh, and green the energy. Uh, Another thing to have in mind uh, when you, you think about energy transition is that uh, this is an area where indeed innovation is huge. And you were alluding to this, Gontram. The relative prices of technologies have moved incredibly in the last few years. Uh, we, we all have in mind that uh, the cost of producing solar electricity has been roughly divided by 10 in 10 years. Uh, the cost of providing uh, electricity from wind farms has decreased by 60%. And we are now facing new revolutions, which are possible in terms in particular of green gases, thinking about green hydrogen, which still needs to become uh, much more competitive. But we, we are convinced that there is a path to competitiveness at a large scale. And, uh, and other uh, renewable energies, such as offshore wind, 
clearly less intermittent than others, very promising, and, and, very, uh, and also uh, issues such as biomethane, which are very anchored in territories. So it's really an area where you have multiple technologies some have already seen big decreases in their prices. Others will see this, will see a decrease in the next few years. So it, it's really an area where you need to be uh, flexible enough, supporting enough different technologies to enable a proper competitive mix at the end of the day. And I think when we think public policies, and I've been convinced about this long before joining NG, uh, the area of energy is really an area where you, you should be careful not to pull, put all your eggs in the same basket. Because the relative prices are moving so quickly, if we had made choices 15 years ago, well, it's likely that we would have uh, made choices which would have resulted in a mix that would not be the best competitive decarbonized mix for, for Europe. So really an area where there is a need to be flexible and pragmatic when you, when you think about uh, public policies. So that leads me to my second point. Huh? First point is we, first priority we all share is align prosperity with, uh, with the, the, the path towards carbon, carbon change, uh, both by reducing consumption and greening energies. How do we get there? A huge role for public policies. And here we are uh, gathered with you, uh, Guntram, at Bruegel. Uh, so it's a great place to be talking about European policies. Uh, Euro European policies will be key on, uh, on guiding uh, this, this, uh, the, the European industry towards decarbonization. Uh, why? Well, first, first issue where uh, European policies will be key, uh, indeed national recovery plans. Uh, that's a good. Uh, that's a good news. The, uh, there is a need to have at least thirty-seven percent, I think, of uh, uh, of uh, spending that's targeted towards the fight against climate change. That's an excellent thing, excellent opportunity, uh, and it should be used fully. And we're all, I think, looking forward to the implementation of these national recovery plans. That's the first first thing. Second thing, uh, there are lots of important uh, decisions that will be made in the next few months. Uh, the European Union is committed to reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by 2030. We know we're not there yet. Uh, a lot of effort have to be made into uh, being able to attain these targets. Uh, the EU is thinking about a number of sub-targets on offshore wind and so on and so forth. That's, that's a very interesting uh, way of thinking, but we all know that it's not enough. And, and what we will be needing, and here I'm, I'm talking in an economist circle, what we will be needing is a way to shift investments in a major way. And I'm thinking about carbon price. We, we, as a business leader, I'm every day convinced that the best way to guide investments into energy transition is to have a proper price for carbon with a wide enough sectoral basis and and an increase that's foreseen to, so that uh, all companies can integrate this and they will make the, the proper decisions. Uh, Vinod was uh, talking about, uh, about amounts and what was needed for digital transition, uh, I, I, something around 40 billion euros a year missing. Well, when you look at energy transition and the latest uh, impact survey by the European Commission, uh, they were talking about 350 billion every year. Uh, so that's uh, something like what, almost 10 times bigger. The, but, and this need for, for financing will not be met only by public resources, of course. The best way is to channel private resources into energy transition. Or, uh, and when I say energy transition, as Jean-Marc was pointing, it's encompassing all sectors. All sectors need to make investments that are compatible with this energy transition. And that's why uh, I'm a firm believer in carbon price and in, in a, as wide as possible circle of countries and with a, a mechanism, an external mechanism to, uh, of course, ensure a level playing field for, with countries that would not participate in this, uh, this carbon price. So, Huge, 
huge need here that I see from, from the European Commission uh, moving. And I think the, the discussion that will be dealt with uh, in the fit for minus 50% discussion is, is the best place to, to address, uh, address this need. And maybe last word on uh, taxonomy, because I'm talking about guiding investment. Uh, when you think about guiding investment, uh, you, you have to be very careful about uh, what, what, is, uh, what, what is the state of technology, what is going to be the state of technology, and what's the best and most resilient way to decarbonize. Uh, let me give you one example. When you think about a number of countries in Eastern Europe that have mix, energy mixes that are heavy on coal, well, for them, there are two ways to decarbonize. One is to go directly to renewable energy, but it's very difficult to develop to scale and very costly in the short run. The other one is to go through gas and gas itself will be greened. And when you, you, what you have to have in mind is that when you have a coal producing, uh, an electricity producing uh, 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 unit with coal, and you, you, uh, and you get rid of it and you, have, uh, you build an, uh, a unit based on gas, you divide by two your greenhouse gas emissions. So on, in a number of countries, in a number of cases, gas is really on the critical path of decarbonizing quickly and cheaply a number of these countries. Uh, so that's what, uh, what, what we, we need to be aware of when we think about taxonomy. Yes, we don't want to be stuck for, with gas forever and and we ng we we came from gas we come from gas but we have we are committed to 100 percent green gas by uh, by 2050 of course so gas will need to be greened very quickly uh, but it, it is on the critical path in a number of cases so in short huge need to align industry with uh, with, with uh, the fight against climate change Good news is that we can, we have lots of European tools and we are very confident that that would be the best way to take a full opportunity of the COVID crisis, which shows that we can act together and, and, is, and is a huge opportunity to change paths towards a sustainable path. Wonderful. Thank you, Claire. Also very, very clear. And um, I, I thought it was fascinating to hear also um, especially your first point about the fact that um, we don't just need to uh, green our energy, we also need to reduce our energy consumption, which is uh, not something that one hears very often, especially not from, from industry leaders. So, so quite an interesting, interesting uh, new aspect. But I think one, one point I want to throw at you now, um, and, and perhaps I start with Vinod, um, is, is this uh, in this conversation we've we've seen I think quite clearly that um, sustainability and digitalization are thought together and you know they they cannot be separated and we need digitalization um, also as a way to uh, you know decarbonize our economy and um, and so, so we know perhaps I can push you uh, to tell us a little bit on you know, where do you see um, those investment needs, really? You talked of the 40 billion um, for connectivity. I mean, is this, um, I mean, can you just say a little bit more how you see this, uh, these investment needs and how do you see the connection between these investment needs um, and our sustainability and our decarbonization? And of course, you also mentioned the NG, the next generation EU. Um, I mean, do you think overall that the mix is right um, uh, in this uh, um, EU recovery fund, 20% digital, 37 green? Is this perhaps artificial, these numbers, or should we, how, how, how do you think of sort of this, this recovery fund and how it will help to do the right digital investment so that we can also become more sustainable? Um, I, I, there's no simple answer to whether the number is right or not. However, my, my take on it is, if you look at the um, the situation the, the the planet is in today, uh, and if you go by the window that is shrinking, and depending on an optimist or a pessimist, you can have a view, but I don't think anybody can uh, disagree that the window is shrinking. If you take that approach, I you know personally believe that the allocation of 37% of the funds for um, you know um, uh, uh, green is absolutely valid. Um, and 
at the same time, from maybe 20% on digitalization to help connectivity, to digitalize economies, to digitalize our, our, our public sector, also seems uh, reasonable. And, and they're talking about, as Jean-Marc pointed out, fairly vast sums of money. So if put to use correctly, if we work uh, like ecosystems that Claire pointed out, I think we can make a, a, a real benefit, you know, real impact, uh, both on the immediate situation, but also create long-term competitiveness. So I believe the sum and magnitude is right. I think the allocation is reflective of the priorities that we must all embrace regardless of the industry. Um, and, and so that's not the dispute for me, but I, we do firmly believe that for the, you know, uh, the, the, uh, for um, uh, green to become a way of life and for businesses to embrace it, digitalization can be a big uh, enabler. Um, but to Claire's point also, I think first step is to reduce our consumption. And uh, one of the things that uh, we have uh, committed to do is by 2025, that we'll be on 100% renewable en en energy on a global basis and by July, 2021 in Europe. And we're pretty confident of achieving uh, these targets of the, uh, of the reduction as well as the change in uh, the source of energy. <clears throat> Jean-Marc, um, any thoughts on this interaction between digital and, and sustainability? So it, it is, and I, I can take our own example, frankly, because we, we have had those discussions. You know, we are more of a tech company driving technology program, but uh, we, we also apply uh, uh, climate change on sustainability. What we have decided to do is that we do IT you know, in many centers around the world. We have decided by 2023 which is tomorrow, you know, all our center around the world will be fully powered by renewable energy. So we're going to do technology work with a sustainable environment. That's a very strong commitment, public commitment we take. But we have taken a bigger commitment, which was to say that by 2025, which is one of the earliest dates we pick, you know, in many, uh, in many ways, uh, we will be carbon neutral as a company. So this means that we will have to do what Claire was describing is not only power, you know, some of our facilities on uh, uh, on uh, different offices through renewable energy, but we will have to also reduce our consumption in terms of office space, in terms of travel, because we will not be able to offset, you know, all of this just by, you know, a, a strategy of uh, offsetting by planting trees or those kind of things. So we will have also to change the way we consume. So. I think it is a pragmatic example that I know because I have been engaged on yes, it requires some investments. It requires some, you know, willingness from the top, but also some investments to get there. And uh, as we are talking with many organizations around the world, we were willing to apply it first to us, you know, because at the end of the day, when we recommend and have the dialogue with other organizations, the first question we always ask, but what are you doing on your side? And so, so that's why we have decided to do but uh, now when we, uh, you know, talk with, uh, uh, with the industry sector, and I think Europe is a good case for that, I am fascinated by the level of investment we are talking about. Frankly, and I'm not sure about all those numbers that you mentioned, Claire, and you mentioned Vinod, but it looks to me like the world is facing a level of investment that has not been common. You know, we have been through many cycles, many industry revolution in the past. We are talking about something that is a massive investment to, as Claire said, to change the current business model of, of our economy. At the end of the day, the current business model doesn't drive to a climate change outcome, which is... So just to change that business model will require in many industries, and I give some examples before, but I really believe that it's going way beyond the energy sector. All industry will have to reinvent some of their business model and their facilities, which will raise the question of, uh, uh, as I say, you know, how we finance all of this, how we are putting uh, the right talent around it. But it is an exciting opportunity because collectively, we can change the direction of our economies and certainly Europe having a very broad and diverse set of economies, we'll have to do those investments. And it's a way also in my view for you to really to say this industry renaissance, 
cannot find a better word because it is a kind of, as we have seen in the past, a renaissance of the way we do business as Europe, which is very exciting. But let's face it, it's going to require you know, not only financial investment, talent investment, leadership investment, government, because we are doing something. And I think what is special also for me with this new revolution we are talking about is the timing. It is a revolution or a reinvention of industry or a renaissance of industry that needs to be done at a certain cadence because of climate change. And that is specific to maybe compared to previous uh, industry change we have seen, we are a bit on the pressure on time. So the time is, is, is part of the equation. Uh, we cannot say where we're going to do it, but you know, if we take 10 years more, it doesn't get, well, it seems to care quite a lot when you look at the climate change thing. So we have to position those investments at a certain level of scale, for sure, but also pace. And that yeah. what make it you know, uh, a, a bit special in my view. Yes, uh, thank you. That's very clear. Also, this aspect of um, time is, is is short, and you know we need to move uh, move quickly. So, so we are getting a lot of questions already. Um, so we have uh, more than thirty questions. Uh, of course, we can't answer all of them, but let me uh, I mean, get, get to Claire to definitely um, also say a word about digitalization. But Claire, I also want to. Uh, already throw one question at you from from the audience so that uh, we start engaging with the audience. Um, so so be, uh, there is a question here by by a person called Niklas, um, who's asking what kind of support do you need do you expect from the public institutions in order to maximize the even spread of this rena renaissance? I mean, so the, this aspect of, of even uh, the distribution of the, uh, the industrial renaissance, uh, both, I guess, within countries, as well as across the EU, but perhaps ac also across societies. So what do we do to make sure that this doesn't increase inequality, but reduces inequality? Um, but also, of course, on the digitalization, Claire, please. Thank you, Guntram. Uh, two excellent questions, uh, and uh, bo both aspects are important. Yeah, I wanted to add a word on digitalization because I didn't mention it, but f I fully agree with what Vino of Jean-Marc have said, uh, and it's really at the core of our industries. Uh, to be uh, in order, well, we, we need to make sure that digitalization is compatible with climate change, and not only compatible, we not only think it's compatible, we think it's a key enabler. In the case of an energy company like Engie, uh, we use digital every day. We use it to optimize our production, in particular, our production of renewable. And just well, everything, a lot depends for wind and solar, a lot depends on weather. You need, you need models, you need, you need to refine where you put your wind farms. I mean, a lot, uh, a lot can be improved with digitalization on the supply side. A lot can be improved on the demand side as well, and we were talking about savings. Savings means decreasing consumption, means, means being sure that your consumption is fit exactly to what you need. Huh? And that's what we do in smart cities, for instance, with public lightning and others, which are adjusted to, to the needs. And then uh, last thing we need to do is to match supply and demand. And that's the basic of uh, the, <laughs> the job of an energy supplier company. On all these aspects, data is absolutely key. Uh, and it has re really become something that's at the core of an industry like uh, like mine. And I would add uh, also very much to echo what Jean-Marc and Vinod were saying that more and more uh, we serve companies who want to become carbon neutral and who, so who need green energy and they need green energy 24-7. Uh, and you know that green energy, uh, well, you think of solar or wind, it's an intermittent uh, energy. So the, the key is really to be able to uh, draw also on hydraulics, draw also on offshore wind, draw also on markets to be able to uh, make sure that you're able to provide green energy uh, throughout the day and throughout, uh, throughout the week. And that's also very much what we do as part of an energy company with data. So data is key. And, and when we provide this green energy, uh, I mean, the first ones who enter into these long-term agreements are actually digital companies, the big GAFA, 
We have a number of contracts with them because they need this uh, green, greener and greener energy. So, uh, so fully, I fully agree with uh, this, this need to uh, make sure both, both go together. Uh, turning to, the, to your question, Guntram, how do we make uh, this recovery even? I think that's a tough question for, tough question for all of us and for, uh, say, uh, political leaders. Uh, clearly, this, the COVID crisis has created a lot of inequalities uh, across countries, but also within countries, uh, with the most vulnerable groups at the risk of being uh, more excluded because of, uh, of this, this, uh, this crisis. Uh, so I think here, I mean, I would, not, uh, I would not put myself in the shoes of a politician, which I'm not, uh, turning to what a company can do. Uh, what we have been very careful to do in this recovery is uh, towards our employees, in addition, of course, to protecting them, was to make sure that there was a good uh, healthcare system for all of them throughout the world. So we, at the beginning of the COVID crisis, uh, we stepped up our guarantees to all employees worldwide in terms of health coverage to make sure that if they had to go to hospital because of COVID, they would be covered. Uh, that was, uh, of course, the case in, uh, in European countries, but in some geographies, not yet. So we, we made sure that was, uh, that was done. That was a way to ensure some form of equality. Right. Uh, another aspect we, are very, we have been very careful about is uh, the issue of young people. Uh, when we think about uh, how an equality can play, uh, one of the aspects is that uh, uh, it's very tough for young people who enter the job market in 2020 or in 2021 uh, to find uh, to find an apprenticeship, to find a job. Uh, so we have made sure that uh, we, we would stick to our previous targets. Uh, and uh, we, if I turn to France, where we have uh, 70,000 employees uh, at NG, uh, we, we have uh, an ambition of having uh, a, a number of uh, apprentice, uh, people on, on, a, uh, on apprenticeship, which is well above the le legal requirement. And we made sure we... we we, we stuck to this target and we're going to still increases in 2021. So make sure we continue to provide the jobs, the job opportunities to young people uh, that we, we committed to do before the crisis. Uh, so I think in a way, all of us has a role to play, a small role to play, uh, to fight against these inequalities that come with COVID. Yeah. Uh, and big companies have a special responsibility, of course, here. Thank you. So we have uh, five minutes left. So um, we have to uh, I have to ask you to come uh, back to me with very short answers to the questions that I give uh, uh, throw at you, um, so that we can at least uh, ask another one or two questions. So one question is by Armin uh, Hebele. Um, he's asking: Is it realistic to expect industry changing to a sustainable path post COVID? Mm -hmm. Will societies not try to catch up on lost prosperity? And grow fast, dirty again. Um, so that's that's one question. And um, if I can um, ask a second question by uh, Mr. Anonymous, uh, from a business perspective, uh, what is the EU's greatest strengths? But perhaps even more interestingly, what are the EU's greatest weaknesses um, when it comes to uh, to uh, to industry? Um, and um, there is also a question by, by Richard, um, which is, um, I, I think, um, quite interesting um, concerning the question of um, uh, stakeholder capitalism and whether or not um, the industrial renaissance doesn't require a change in the way capitalism is organized um, uh, towards more of a stakeholder uh, capitalism. Uh, so I think those three questions are, are very interesting. and. If I can ask you to come with very short answers, perhaps you don't answer all three of them, just one or two um, that you are, you think you're, uh, it's most interesting. Um, and then uh, then we have to conclude. So perhaps I start with Jean-Marc. Yeah, and this is uh, very much the debate we have with many organizations and we have also internally. I think I will not go and say that sustainability on, the, on business are in opposition. I really believe today that as leaders, we know that if we want to be successful, meaning that if we want to match the demand of our clients, we need to deliver products and services that are much more sustainable. There is a direct link between the companies that go for sustainability and go for digital 
on their ability to grow. So I will really don't put in our mind that, you know, as we have to recover losses, you know, we will not play the game on digital and sustainability. There is a direct link between business success means that you go for it, which is probably a different paradigm that maybe 10 years ago, but this is a paradigm shift we are in. And yes, I don't say it's always easy, but this is what it takes to be successful as business leaders. Uh, Dino. Yeah, I agree with Jean-Marc. I don't think there's any dispute uh, where the, on the importance of sustainability. One aspect I'd like to highlight is from an employee perspective, we find in our business and many other forward-looking businesses that there is an internal push also to, to be purpose-driven, to be planet conscious, to be sustainable. And therefore, I think even to attract talent and remain competitive in the long run, um, th this is going to be important that businesses focus on it. So there is uh, an understanding of the current situation. There are external pressures based on what's happening in the planet, but there's also a very strong internal push in all our businesses. And I actually think Europe is much more aware and European employees are much more aware and place this at a higher level of importance than other, you know, other regions of the world that I've worked in. So it's a, it is a, a force that we should use for our benefit. Well, thank you. Uh, so Claire, you have um, the last word um, and there, I think there's two, uh, two questions also, uh, also that, um, that um, uh, you can ask Bill. So super short, uh, yes, sustainability is key for our businesses, that's clear. Uh, and B, uh, fully share the fact that when we align our businesses and our performance with positive impact on planet and people. And by the way, that's exactly what we have at NG in our raison d'être, our purpose, consigning performance with positive impact for people and planet. When you do this, as not, not only you are sustainable because you have a sustainable business, hence successful in the long run, but also you attract talents. And that's very much bridging to what Jean-Marc and Vinod were saying. When we divide it by two, our carbon footprint, we saw the number of applications to NG being multiplied by three. And, and talents are key today. So, so I just hear from my team that we do have a little bit more time. I, I, um, uh, I don't know if you, if you still have the time we can actually ask because there's 30, 33 questions actually in this chat. So, so if you agree, I mean, I, I, I somehow thought we have one hour, but we have a bit more. So. So perhaps we can take another three questions because uh, I think it's getting very interesting and people on the chat are very, very engaged. And um, uh, let's let's try to, to take one more round with, uh, I would say, uh, um, three three more questions. Um, and and really, I, I thought, I mean, one, uh, one question I still wanna push you a little bit on and you didn't really answer it is this question of the weaknesses um, in the area of industrial policy. Um, so, so really, I, I think, I mean, I think there is a sort of a big debate at the moment on, um, you know, what should industrial policy look like in Europe? Um, and um, I think one question really we need to answer is a bit more this question, you know, what, what is actually missing? And to my mind, the COVID, um, the COVID um, vaccination delays um, perhaps show us that we do have some, some problems on the um, some weaknesses uh, in sort of mobilizing in, in real time production capacity and you know doing it at the European level because still a lot of that is, is happening essentially at the national level. So that's that's perhaps one question um, that we can um, we can spend a bit of time on still. Um, and and I guess um, the, the second question is um, and it's again related to um, to the regional inequality. Um, uh, Mr. Anonymous is asking: Is Europe's diversity um, is it uh, actually um, a strength or is it a weakness um, in uh, in uh, you know decarbonizing and uh, and digitalization? Uh, do we do we need to think more about lifting? The peripheral, uh, the peripheral countries um, in in all of this, and how how will digitalization and and uh, and uh, and sustainability actually impact um, the um, 
the more peripheral uh, countries of the EU. Um, and um, okay, and then there's a question on skills and uh, I think the human capital and the talent that I think we all uh, have discussed quite a bit is, um, you know, what new approaches are companies uh, actually engaging on to skill and reskill um, uh, talent, and how do you see uh, also the exit from from COVID um, in this? Um, you know, how will people return back to the office, and how will we ensure that the skilling and reskilling and the teleworking and the team uh, building uh, will continue to be uh, to be working well? Um, so, so let let's let's look at those three. Um, three aspects and perhaps we know we start with you this time um yeah sure um uh, firstly i think on on human capital I, I would like to just before addressing that specific point itself um jean marc mentioned this we need to look at these technologies that we enable digital and for sustainability or in other areas first and foremost as um you know essential for competing on a global stage but very quickly, I think we need to look at what new opportunities it creates. And also we're very focused on employment. We need to think of what new roles and new jobs it creates. And I personally am quite optimistic that if we embrace that attitude, the number of jobs that will be created is actually fairly significant and we will not have an employment challenge. I'm not of the school of thought that believes that technology and AI and robotics completely displaces the net number of jobs. I think you'll have certain kinds of jobs that displace, but many new ones that create gets created. But that requires proactive action and it requires sustained action. And that action needs to be a combination of both, um, uh, you know, uh, supported by regulators and governments and with a significant role that the private sector employers play in enabling those transitions. So that's the backdrop of, 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 my, of my commentary. Um, and, and so on, on human capital, yes, new approaches are, are required. Um, and the approach really is to, um, and, and I'm speaking from a very pragmatic business standpoint, not necessarily from a policy standpoint, is to actually boldly assess what could happen to your business or what could happen to your community or society or country. You can take it and apply it, you know, if a technology were to linearly grow, whether that happens or not, and to clinically assess what the displacements could be in roles and what new roles get created. I feel that quite often, even at a micro level in businesses or a macro level at a country, this is not done with, it's done with a lot of politeness and a lot of optimism and hope and expecting the past will continue. It needs to be done in a more forward looking way and almost look at the, um, worst case situation, and then, you know, see, you know, what, 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 how you would deal with that. And COVID has shown us that, right? It's shown us that a, this is not the worst case situation, but something that none of us expected can happen. And now the solutions are emerging. I believe we need to do the same thing with skills and roles also is to imagine what if a complete factory could only be run with robots, which is possible in some cases, what would then we do? What kind of roles will have to be created? What skills will be need, needed? What kind of talent will be needed to keep those robots serviced and functioning? And then to work back from that. I see this only happening in pockets and it will be good for us to do this in a much more systematic and at scale manner. So that's my view as far as the question on human uh, human capital is concerned. Um, I don't want to hog the stage, but on return back from office, this is a topic uh, we're very actively uh, uh, looking at. <clears throat> Our view is that it is unlikely that we will return, uh, you know, for a long time, if ever, to the way we operated a year ago. Um, the feedback that we're getting from our employees also is that. They like this way of working, but within reason and for certain kinds of work. So it depends on the company. I've heard everything from 50% to 60% and more, but that seems to be kind of the average for the amount of time people believe, at least in the services business um, and knowledge-based businesses that work can be done from home. After that, there's a need for collaboration. There's a need for creativity and innovation. There's a need for our own mental well-being and social well-being that you want to be in the office. There's a need for us to build an association with an institution, with a brand that needs physical presence. These things won't happen just if we work purely on a remote basis. 
So they, it will vary by roles, it will vary by sector, but anywhere from say maybe even 40 to 60% of work being done from home looks like where we will end up um, as businesses. Uh, but again, there's still some more time. I think we have six months of working more from home, home and less from the office before the vaccine with uh, distribution challenges are overcome uh, and there's uh, enough uh, immunity in society before we can uh, go back to, uh, uh, to the office regularly. Although Jean-Marc Jean and I do sneak in once in a while, as we were saying earlier before the call. Jean-Marc. Um... Yeah, yeah, no, I very much uh, share what uh, Vinod say on the talent side, on return to office. I think I get a sense in the question, Guntram, that there was also willing to ask us what, what maybe doesn't work that well, you know, in this. And that's fair because we, we are business leaders. We are not naive, you know, we, we, we have a vision. We want to, you know, share that vision with this group, but there are things that can do, that we can do better. You know, I think, Claire, I think you mentioned that carbon price is not so, you know, let, let's look at it. You know, we talk about it. I remember in many instances, many forums, you know, I do not fully give up on carbon price, but uh, the reality is that uh, it's hard. You know, I think what we are doing as a company and what we are recommending with uh, many business leaders is at least that they adopt a carbon price for their own business. You know, many companies now around the world make business decisions on investments based on the carbon price. Short-term investments around 30 to 40 euros, longer-term investments more around 100 euro plus. So there are discussion already based on this, but the, the overall framework you know, may make progress. We see initiative in China, in Europe, and in part of the North American, but let's face it, carbon price will be a massive accelerator. Uh, it's not there for the reason probably everybody knows. It's not easy in the current governance of the world to implement something of that nature. And uh, we have to accept that the world is like this, you know, and uh, even though it will be a massive accelerator, it's not fully available. It's partly available. I don't fully give up. You know, we may get there, but the reality is that we are not there. Um, the second question was, around, I get a sense also around Europe, as diversity is it. Uh, let's face it, those topic requires at least a mobilization at European level, because the reality when we talk around our industry, our ecosystem, you know, we are dealing with businesses in China or in North America that are at massive scale, you know, so it is clear that having investment alignment around ecosystem, around industry ecosystem at European level could give us a much bigger scale to face those competitions that we are seeing around the world, you know, uh, and that I think something where I expect this uh, you know, industry recovery plan we're talking about because of its scale and its focus, give us the opportunity this time to recognize the diversity of Europe. And diversity is pretty good generally for innovation, but, but also give us the ability uh, to scale and to partner as an ecosystem to move faster. I think that's also something that uh, uh, is on our mind and it's to be demonstrate with this current recovery plan that we can have a bigger impact across ecosystem at European level, because I see that as an opportunity uh, to be even more competitive in the current environment. So, you know, even though I am optimistic overall, I just want to, to answer and give some, you know, candid feedback, yes, it could be better, I'm sure, but, uh, you know, at least those two points are, were on my mind. Wonderful, and um, uh, Claire, let me, let me uh, uh, give you the floor and perhaps, uh, push you again a little bit on this, this regional aspect and also perhaps with this whole question of the talent. I mean, there are some academics that now already say, well, you know, the cities uh, might be re less relevant than they used to be because, you know, we, we used to go all to the city downtown and meet downtown to actually meet and socialize and uh, do our work and do our professional services. And uh, We've now learned that a lot can be done digitally. So why why not actually have our homes at the beach uh, somewhere uh, and you know just move once a week or once a month uh, to Paris and and so on and so forth, which is also an opportunity for regional development, of course. Um, so so I mean just if you can also give us a sense where you're thinking on the talent is and what it means for 
um, sort of regional economic activity. I find that mm -hmm. fascinating. Uh -huh. <laughs> two, two, good, uh, two good questions indeed, Gunshram, and I'm, I'm dreaming of, of uh, being currently at the beach. <laughs> I'm at the office, I'm by the way. <laughs> uh, no, um, but maybe starting with diversity uh, to, to pick up uh, and regional, uh, regional diversity. Uh, there's no doubt Europe is diverse. And in particular, when you think about energy policies, uh, I mean, and that's part of our job. Huh? We have to adapt to different situ situations, to different regulations, to different national choices. When you think about uh, uh, the debate now in Belgium, uh, it's very different from the debate in Germany, very different from the debate in France or in Poland. So there is diversity, and I think that's fine. Huh? Like Jean-Marc was saying, that's part of Europe. Europe is uh, is diverse. That's part of its uh, its beauty, I would say. Uh, what 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 we need to be able, and that goes also to the point of uh, strengths and weaknesses. What we need to be able collectively, what Europe needs to be able to do, is to overcome this diversity and align on some common goals. And then there will be diverse paths to get there. And decarbonization is a good uh, good example. Uh, there are different paths and uh, there is not one right path. Different countries will have different choices and that's fine. They have different realities on the ground. Uh, but that's a way, I think, to make sure that we go in the same direction, to adopt goals, that's what Europe did, and to have tools that are powerful enough to guide these goals. And then I would uh, echo again what Jean-Marc said on, on carbon price. Huh? Carbon price is a, a way to respect the diversity at the same time a clear signal of the way to be taken. Uh, and because I'm not naive, as Jean-Marc was saying, yes, there will be huge redistribution effects of carbon price across countries, across people in a country, across industries. So these have to be thought about carefully when, uh, when we think about this, uh, this implementation of carbon price. Uh, how do we help the transition? Uh, and probably uh, the path has to be clear, but maybe not too steep in the beginning. I mean, these are all things that will be we we'll need to be carefully thought about to enable a transition that's uh, that's sustainable, also in uh, in social uh, social terms, and the reskilling of uh, of sectors where there needs to be reskilling. Um, going to your question, uh, Gunshram, which was more on uh, on cities. And, uh, and what, which goes to, to the point of, uh, yes, what's the future of work tomorrow? Uh, are we going all to work from home and come to the office once in a while, or is it going to be different? Um, I, I would dare to say as a first point that this is a question that may be relevant for all of us, but is not for all the people. Uh, uh, we at Engie as an electrician, uh, 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 sorry, an energy provider and supplier of services, in, in the worst period of the crisis, we had tens of, uh, of thousands of people on the ground. Uh, we, we actually, we are 170,000. We put more than 60,000 in remote work, but we had lots of people still on the ground because when you need to uh, help a customer which has a heating system that doesn't work, you, you don't do everything from your home. Uh, so let's not forget this point, which is obvious, of course, but is an important aspect of it, including in terms of social cohesion. There are some jobs which we won't be able to, which people won't be able to do from the beach, which raises a first first point, I think, for all of us as, a, as managers. Uh, how, how, how do we ensure cohesion? How do we ensure belonging? Uh, and do we want to create a kind of two speed uh, population within our companies where some some go 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 to the ground and others can work from wherever they want. That's a big of a, I, I think, a, and we don't have answers. And I think the fair, fair point is that all our companies are, are currently having uh, working groups about the future of work. So I don't have answers yet, but clearly there are several aspects to be taken into account. But, and this is one, I think, uh, equal, well, evenness between, uh, between people in a company. And then the second point, and, and there I would very much agree with what Vino was saying, is that we have seen the power of working from home we have run our companies from home uh, for weeks. Uh, at the same time, and, and uh, the meeting today is great, but I'm, I'm sure it would be even, even better if we were face-to-face -face and able to, uh, to, to interact even more, more directly. I mean, there, there is, I would say, a sort of life 
a quality of relationship that you have when you when you face people, when you can solve an issue over the coffee machine, that's more difficult to do when uh, when each of us is in a different uh, different space. So I like Vino and Jean-Marc. I don't believe we'll go to uh, a, a situation where we we'll live at the beach and we'll we'll come to the office once in a while. I think we'll go to a situation where probably we need to rethink why people go to the office. When they go to the office, it's not simply to be sitting next to each other, it's to interact. Uh, and probably, by the way, we, we at NG are thinking about our next headquarters, uh, which is a big building project that we have. And that kind of thinking will be very much going into how we lay the grounds uh, in the next headquarters. Probably more meeting rooms, because when people come to the office, we, uh, it's for a good reason. It's not to do what they can do from home. Fascinating um, and, and really things that are very much on the mind, I think, of all of us. I mean, also for us, of course, um, we've seen um, the benefits of digitalization. I mean, we have integrated um, even better the team than we did before um, because we have people around the world uh, doing research for us. And it's much easier now to bring them closely into the research team. At the same time, I think, Claire, what you said, the salt of life, um, it's a very nice term. I think, indeed, I think we all miss also the personal interaction over the coffee machine that you, you that you refer to. So clearly, clearly big challenges. Um, I, I think we are coming uh, really close to, to the end. Uh, I mean, there's perhaps one question that I, I can still mention here, um, and perhaps one of you wants to take it up by, by Erika. Uh, Metzger, who's asking, well, none of you mentioned European and national social partners. Um, what role do you see for social partners in industrial policy? Um, so that, that might be perhaps um, a question one of you might want to take up. Um, uh, and, uh, and then we want to, uh, want to conclude. Uh, um, who, who would like to talk about social partners? Um, well, I'll take a shot at it, but uh, maybe with an interpretation of social partners as uh, NGOs and other organizations who are working on societal impact, I believe there's a big role, um, one, to make, um, in our context, technology more accessible to a wider population, uh, to also play a really important role in bridging things like digital uh, divide, which we see happening in parts of society partly because of affordability, sometimes it's because of age, sometimes it's even because of unfortunate things like race and ethnicity. So the social partners can play a role in that. I also see social partners playing a big role in innovation because quite often they are um, uh, 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 you know, fa facing situations or experiencing and having exposure to constraints and constraints often can drive a lot of innovation. So we work um, in the healthcare space and education um, with social partners. Um, and I hope I got my definition right here. Uh, but um, uh, regardless, it's a point to be made that it's both about government, private sector, as well as social partners coming together um, and really making a difference. And this is not um, you know, wishful thinking. It is happening on the ground today and definitely uh, a, a constituency that should be included um, as we think about the Renaissance in Europe. Um, Claire, do you want to add something? To yeah, may, maybe two words. Uh, one to say that uh, I think in our in our companies, at least I'm speaking for, for mine, NG, social dialogue is very important in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, when, when uh, And especially uh, I was talking about the, the changes that are required in the energy sector. Uh, when you are in a sector where relative prices move, where you need to think all the times of what, what your business model has to be, you have to be able to embark your people. And social dialogue is, is key. That's my first point. Then turning to the EU level, uh, we were talking earlier about uh, the fact that uh, businesses need to be uh, sustainable in order to, uh, to, to be, um, well, to, to be performant in, uh, in the long run. I think part of this sustainability is social sustainability mm. uh, and in this uh, in, in this respect I think social partners are important as a, a, a partner in the dialogue on how, how to ensure that in Europe we we, we keep a, a kind of uh, 
uh, uh, well, we, we know that there is a lot of subsidiarity, huh? a lot goes to member states, but there is still a common core of, uh, I would say, a safety net that uh, to me is, is important in ensuring the social sustainability of our business models. So I think in this, uh, social partners in Europe have an important role to play. Um, on the same for me as a company where we are engaging ourselves uh, is really uh, skills. You know, we, we believe that, as I say, we have all to step up as businesses, but we have to get that done with government, academic sector, and also social partner, because we believe uh, this will be a significant uh, challenge and opportunity, as we say, on, at least in my company, that's where we are focusing beyond our own employees what we can do for communities in terms of bringing you know, our ability to skill talent around those new technology, around those new energy transition, and bring that to the communities, leveraging you know, the network, the social partner. I think this is what, as a company, we try to do and give back to communities, because we see that as, first of all, something that we have some experience on, but certainly something that will be very important in the next couple of years. Wonderful. I think, uh, of course, we have not asked all um, 36 or 7 questions that were coming in, but I think we covered a really a lot of ground and discussed very, very many aspects of what industry uh, leaders are thinking about today, day to day, but also where uh, is the vision and where do we go. And I certainly take away um, this very strong emphasis on uh, both sustainability um, uh, in all various aspects and the, the, the need to combine sustainability with digitalization. I mean, that these two things are really uh, more and more inseparable and are actually also a good business proposition, which I think is also a, a very strong, uh, strong point uh, to be made. And so that perhaps gives us some, some hope uh, for the policy system also that um, you know, the, uh, the major um, ideas that are put forward, uh, such as the Green Deal, um, really may be feasible um, in, the next, in the next 10 or 20 years. And so, so it's certainly exciting transformations and transitions that are ahead of us. And I learned a lot. And I hope you in the audience, you enjoyed the conversation as well. Um, I certainly would like to thank very much our three speakers, um, Vinod Kumar, uh, Jean-Marc Olanier, and Claire Vaisson. Thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your insights and thoughts. It was really uh, a lot of fun and uh, a real pleasure to host you today. Thanks a lot. Yeah.